For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today to unpack his book titled Township Politics, Civic Struggle for a New South Africa, is Chief Executive Officer at Equesi Institute, Mzwanele Mayegiso. Welcome, Mr. Mayegiso. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So, Mr. Mayegi, so this book details the evolution, or uh, if I may say, the transition of the civic movement in our country, especially during the 80s and 90s. Why is it important for South Africans to read uh, or else trace the history? I think the book, in fact, uh, Township Politics, was undertaken uh, before, you know, the advent of democracy. That is before 1994. Mm. So, it, it, you know, it's a project that accumulated over time. Mm. It was basically taking stock of our struggles in the communities. And from my perspective as an active, you mm. know, participant, so I was kind of detailing our experiences, what we did, the methods of organizations that mm. we developed. And uh, then it was published in 1996. In, in a sense, I think in South Africa, we are used to people writing stories about us, not us writing about ourselves. So this book is actually the first of its kind uh, where an activist wrote their own experiences and from an intellectual point of view. Mm -hmm. In that sense, uh, I think it's, it's a great contribution to knowledge production in South Africa. And to say to people that they, the time has come for them to write their own stories and from their own experiences, mm -hmm. instead of having somebody from outside who may have no affinity with the challenges that people confront, but just they have the power of the pen. Mm -hmm. So it's an outsider mm -hmm. looking in, not an insider, you know, looking in to project outside. Mm -hmm. So township politics, in a sense, is not just an intellectual academic book. It's also a personal story of somebody who was involved mm. in the struggles for freedom in South Africa. Mm. Yeah. And in, in the book, you paint a picture of uh, the Alexandra Township. When I read the book, I got a sense of how people used to live back then and the struggles that they faced. And unfortunately, some of them face them even today. So you also say that in the book, despite the fact that apartheid was rigorously planned, its ending has been unplanned and chaotic. Can you briefly tell us why you're saying that? Yes, um, I think if, if we just go back to, you know, uh, the, the production of the book itself. So those of us who were active in the community, we, we, we then uh, saw ourselves getting into this bandwagon of freedom. That on its own, I think, was a, a progressive culmination of those struggles. Mm. But then um, I think uh, soon after, the, 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 the question of uh, perhaps the chaos that is discussed in the book, it's when you are used to struggling against something and then that something crumbles and collapses because of your energies. Mm -hmm. Then, okay, the, the next question is, what happens after? Now, I think that, that preoccupation, you know, with what happens after wasn't discussed properly because mm -hmm. the question is, if you are fighting against something, once you win, mm -hmm. then what comes in its place? Mm -hmm. So we just saw ourselves now in a space where we were really in charge of government and uh, having to grapple now with the challenges of governance which we didn't have before mm -hmm. we're only thinking about this system that was not representative and uh, we did have some concepts that were saying how the type of government we're looking for and so on my sense is that um the negotiated n nature of that, you know, period, mm. uh, the true Cordessa mm. and so on, kind of put, you know, uh, on the side those novel ideas that we had because negotiations by their very nature, they are a give and take. Mm -hmm. 
So you, you, you give something and then you take something. In the process, something falls true mm. because you don't get everything that you wish for. So I think for me, that's a, a, a bit of what I refer to as uh, the chaos of transition mm. because I think it brought with it um, new challenges because whilst we've achieved you know, the freedom, the freedom is political, mm. it's not economic because it was not on the table at Codesa. So I think for me that's the chaos because we indeed, we wanted to have this political freedom where we're no longer getting arrested or killed and mm. so on by this rapacious regime. But now once that is achieved, the economy which is the critical aspect of that freedom was not on the table at mm. Condesa. And for me, I think that's the misgiving, you know, as far as that period was concerned. Mm. We still experience a bit of the past in the present. So in other words, the suffering, mm. you know, is still experienced in the communities. It goes back to that question of the economy. We didn't touch on the economy and we said, okay, we'll, we'll see how this thing unfolds. Let's just, you know, deal with the political and I think um, the past 28 years of freedom have been good and I think bad at the same time because the township still is there, Alexander Township. Mm -hmm. When I say the township, the township denotes type of suffering, you see. When we talk of the suburb, the suburb denotes progress of mm -hmm. some kind because if you are in the suburb, you know, you have an ambient environment. If you are in the township, you know, it's this cluttered environment and uh, it's tense and so on. So you still have the continuation of the township in the old apartheid sense, the suburb in the old apartheid sense. Mm. So the person in the suburb is potentially well-to-do, employed and so on. The one in the township is unemployed and uh, is facing all manner of challenges, you know, of existence. How do you put bread on the table and so on? So I think that there hasn't been a strategic, you know, attention paid to mitigating the distinction between the suburb and the township. When I say the township and the suburb, I'm just using this as a metaphor because mm -hmm. it basically reflects the, the, the race issue in South Africa so that if you are black, you are in the township. Mm. If you are white, you are in the suburb, you see. Obviously, we know that when you talk about the suburb, it's no longer the original suburb, you know, the one which was purely white. You do have a bit of percentage from the previously disadvantaged, you know, people who are working as civil servants in government, mm. politicians and so on. They have money now to buy properties in the suburb. But uh, the bulk is still in the township. So the township still represents the racial dichotomy of South Africa. For instance, Alexander Township, people talk about 40% unemployment. So if you walk there in the street during the day, it's as if it's weekend mm. because people have nothing to do. Now you just oppose that with the suburb and uh, you know the, 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 the cruel example is that Alexandra itself is just a stone's throw from Santin. So just across the street, you know, there's Different this opulence yeah. and so on. Uh, when you just oppose that with the poverty that is on the other side, mm. then you see the cruelty of, of the whole thing. So then this book is basically speaking to uh, the challenges of building an organization under conditions of oppression. But also, I think within the book, it talks about possibilities for the future. So, which is, which is why I think it's still quite relevant, you know, to this day. Mm -hmm. It was published in 1996, but 28, 29 years later, when you open the mm -hmm. pages of the book, it's as, it's as if you are still in Alexandra, because it talks about those conditions mm -hmm. that haven't changed. This book was published in New York City, in the US. It was available that side. 
never mm. really available in South Africa, except at university libraries in, in the country. So now we relaunched it at Exclusive Books in Rosebank. The reason was that then I wanted South Africans to have familiarity with this first volume, uh, just relating to where we come from, mm -hmm. you know, as, as, as a country, mm. the, 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 the struggles that were waged, the experiences and so on. Mm -hmm. Before we go to the second volume of Township Politics, mm -hmm. which will be coming out in the second quarter of 2024, the, the second volume then takes us from 1996, when this first volume was published, mm -hmm. to the present in terms of the quality differences mm. that one can discern, you know, between pre-94 and post-94. In other words, what do we have to show for 28 years of democracy mm. in South Africa? Okay. That dichotomy that I'm talking about between the township and the suburb, mm. has, it, has it been, you know, uh, breached or, or, or what, mm. you see? So we, we're talking about that. Okay. So Mr. Maiki, so as you've just said that uh, the book still uh, talks about the things that people in the township are still struggling with. Briefly tell us about the projects that you are working on. This book uh, talks about civics, the, the role that these community organizations played, you know, uh, to bring about democracy in South Africa. The development challenges that were confronted by communities uh, during that period. Now, when, when one looks at uh, post-1994 period to today, that's the period that is captured in the second volume that is forthcoming in 2024. Mm -hmm. it's, it's to understand the, the, the kind of the quality difference between the period pre-1994, that is pre-democracy, and the post-apartheid you know, uh, period, which is now the actual democracy period. Mm -hmm. What is critical is the concept of organization. So to what extent do these civic organizations that were so critical in the struggle against apartheid and in the struggle to challenge the, the authority mm. of, 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 of the apartheid state, to what extent are they still as, as, as strategic as they were before? Now, I, I spend most of my time in the, in the U.S., and every time I come back to South Africa, I'm, I'm kind of struck by the absence mm. of a political development voice that is more relative to what used to be, you know, under apartheid. Um, because I, I, I would just observe, you know, protests, people protesting, you know, there's no water and, and so on and so on, but there's no coherent voice mm. that is interpreting, you know, these concerns by residents as it used to be, mm. you know, under apartheid, because we were there as civic leaders. We eloquently interpreted the challenges that were confronted by communities at the time. But now I look everywhere, I don't see that kind of voice. And then I realize that those civics had, had almost collapsed. Well, what also is part of this book project, uh, the second volume, I'm also helping uh, these organizations to revive. And we, 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 we set up recently, uh, on the 25th of March, we were launching the National Interim Civics Committee of SANCO. SANCO mm -hmm. is this organization that I'm talking about in mm -hmm. the book, South African National Civics Organization, which was launched in 1994 in now Gebecha. It was called Port Elizabeth at the time. Mm -hmm. So we were celebrating 31 years of, of, of Sanko, and then we, we used that opportunity to reflect on where this organization might be. We, we, through our conversations, we, we, we discovered that actually it's absent mm. from the lives of South Africans, it, it, that it had been bureaucratized between warring factions mm. within the top leadership. So now, for instance, uh, there are about three known factions of Sanko nationally. 
So people who call themselves Sanko leaders, they keep fighting each other mm. and so on. So on the 25th of March, we, we brought them together and we, say, we said, as founders of, of the Civic, we said, please comrades, it's time now to just discard everything else mm. and rebuild this very historic organization so that it can be able to champion yet again mm. the, the development challenges that confront communities. Because, you see, I think the problem when, when, when you build organizations to fight against a particular system, like apartheid, mm. it's easier because that system is clarified. If you are black, you're not supposed to be there. Mm. So there's anger that's built in, you know, in the system. So it's easy to build organizations. But under a democracy, suddenly it gets a bit like mucky, <laughs> confused, you're not sure, mm. you know. But then I think that's what led to the demise of these historic organizations. Because after 1994, the, these civic leaders who were like the backbone of the struggle were now taken from these organizations to government. Mm. And that was a very progressive development actually because they had experience of running organizations and so on. They only needed to be empowered in terms of now, how do you manage things when you are in charge? Now, but the negative of that positive development mm. was that the organizations themselves were left without leaders, without the experience of those leaders, you know, who were there before. So these comrades now were in government, at local government level, provincial and national. They were doing a good job, you know, because you need good people to run the democracy. But uh, at the level of civil society, where you need these organizations to continue to be strong, no, so that they, they are able to check what the government is doing to represent communities. I always call them the cushion between the government and communities, mm. just to make sure that there's a good understanding between the two institutions. But now, without good experienced leadership being there, the community suffers. What then you would see is government thinking, you know, that okay, the community wants houses mm. without necessarily water. going, you know, <laughs> to the community, mm. but maybe they want water, you yeah. see, or maybe they want jobs mm. so that they can buy houses on their own. So now the government decides what the community wants because these are comrades as well. But for me, I think the argument is that it, it, it doesn't matter that I am a comrade and I come from the community. Mm -hmm. The moment I leave the organization to a government post, I'm now confronted by the dynamics of governance at that level. Mm -hmm. I can no longer think that I represent the interests of those people. Mm -hmm. So a leader from that perspective should emerge who then says, this is our reality. But it's good to have somebody like me who is from that space mm. because I'm, I'm able to understand quicker. But when there's no voice from the community, I this see. whole thing kind of, you know, uh, collapses. Mm -hmm. So on the 25th of March, then we said, let us actually revive this organization, reunify these factions, and then work towards a relaunch of, of the civics nationally. So to that effect, uh, we brought all the factions together and then we said, as part of this, let us actually brief the former presidents about this development. Let us have bilateral meetings with, uh, you know, like the alliance organizations, talking of the ANC, SACP, COSATU, yeah. and then organizations in civil society like the churches, mm. you know, the South African Council of Churches, independent churches, traditional leaders, um, and other agencies that have a stake in the development of communities. Mm. We, we, we are succeeding in, in, in that process. Thank you very much for, for giving us that insight, and I hope a lot of our, our viewers will, will read the book so that they know what uh, went uh, on during that time and they will be able to read the second book as you've just told us and see the importance of organizing themselves uh, in their societies. 
Thank you. Yes, uh, I appreciate this moment with you, with you Sanele. I, I also do think that, um, you know, society getting access to the book, you know, empowers us to be able to understand where we're coming from mm. and where we are and possibly where we might be going. This is where the second volume comes in to say, well, for the past, you know, X number of years, 29 years, this has been the situation. How do we then build mechanisms, you know, for the future by building these organizations? Mm -hmm. So currently, uh, as part of this book, the, the Township Politics, um, like I was saying, we, we are helping to rebuild the civic organizations. And we want to just observe and see how they function under a, a, a democratic period. And th can they be able to be that strategic link between mm. the government and society and make sure that things happen, they, you know, make sure that there's employment, make sure that there's no load shedding, and, and so on and so on, you know. Um, so for me, I'm excited about this period. I think it, 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 it has a lot, you know, to offer South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Chief Executive Officer at Equesi Institute, Mzwanele Mayegiso, in conversation with Polity, discussing his book titled Township Politics, Civic Struggle for a New South Africa.